In April 1865, Richmond, Virginia was in flames. After four years of unthinkable suffering, the stakes of the American Civil War converged here. The fate of the Democratic Republic and the future of four million people held in slavery. The city is captured. The United States Army controls the streets. And the American president tours the ruins of the Confederate capital. How did it come to this? The origins of the war ran deep in the nation's past, where the struggle over slavery had divided the United States since its founding. The monetary value of the four million people held in slavery was greater than all the country's banks, factories, and railroads combined. Three-fourths of white Southern families did not own slaves, yet most still believed slavery to be natural, necessary, and just. God hath forever united the master and slave. Man cannot put them asunder. The cotton produced by enslaved people grew into the nation's leading export even as the North and the South developed different economies. As the nation expanded to the Pacific, Americans hotly debated the institution's place in the country's future. Would the United States continue to extend slavery? The white man's happiness cannot be purchased by the black man's misery. Dedicated abolitionists, men and women, black and white, risked their lives to call for an immediate end to slavery. Southern political leaders demanded the federal government protect slavery wherever it extended. In the 1850s, a new political party, the Republicans, rose to limit slavery's expansion. Elected as the party's first president, Abraham Lincoln promised to preserve slavery where it existed, while rejecting secession as the essence of anarchy. But seven states in the South voted to separate from the Union even before Lincoln took office. Our new government rests upon the great truth that the Negro is not equal to the white man. Some delegates from Upper South states argued that staying under the U.S. Constitution offered the best protection for slavery. Secession is not only war, it is emancipation. It is widespread ruin to our people. The secessionists prevailed. We have entered upon the career of independence, and it must be inflexibly pursued. In your hands, my dissatisfied fellow countrymen, is the momentous issue of civil war. You can have no conflict without being yourselves the aggressors. As the new capital of the Confederacy, Richmond teemed with activity. The Tredegar Ironworks mobilized for war while factories and mills ran nonstop. Across America, young white men enlisted in enormous numbers. Our fathers made this country. We, their children, are to save it. Let us drive back the invading abolition foe or die defending our homes, our wives and daughters, and the graves of our ancestors. Soldiers in the Confederacy believe they fought to protect their families and homes. Men in the United States believe they fought to preserve a precious republic against an unlawful rebellion. Just weeks after secession and Fort Sumter, enslaved people began to escape to United States Army outposts. Confederates demanded the return of their property. U.S. commanders at Fort Monroe and soon elsewhere heeded requests of the enslaved men to stay. Wherever the U.S. Army advanced, thousands of enslaved people sought refuge with its soldiers. 
In the years ahead, the armies and navies of the United States and the Confederacy fought from the Atlantic to beyond the Mississippi River, from the outskirts of Washington, D.C., to outposts in New Mexico and Colorado. The United States launched massive but unsuccessful campaigns in 1862 to seize Richmond. Robert E. Lee took command of the Confederate Army of Northern Virginia. Stonewall Jackson and Jeb Stewart rose to prominence. In January 1863, Lincoln issued the Emancipation Proclamation, targeting the Confederacy's great advantage and vulnerability, the labor of enslaved people. The proclamation declared slavery abolished in states that remained in rebellion and authorized the United States colored troops. Food shortages sparked bread riots in Richmond and other southern cities. Opposition to a draft for the U.S. Army prompted riots in New York. The U.S. won key victories, but the Confederate Army still held vast territory. In 1864, U.S. General William T. Sherman drove towards Atlanta, while General Ulysses S. Grant launched the Overland Campaign into the heart of Virginia. As Grant attempted to envelop Richmond, his army confronted massive Confederate earthworks in Petersburg. Myers tunneled beneath the lines and detonated four tons of gunpowder. The earth began to shake as though the hand of God intended to reverse the laws of nature. Grant's officers ordered regiments of United States colored troops to attack after the explosion. They met a furious counterattack by the Confederates. The Battle of the Crater and the Overland Campaign failed to drive Lee from Richmond. The dead lay thick, both white and colored, Union and rebel. Wounded men flooded military hospitals and private homes already overwhelmed with casualties. We see the most sickening sights, such as men with their limbs blown off, without a shudder. We are waiting at the cot side and closing their eyes one by one as they pass away. Two months later at New Market Heights, outside Richmond, black soldiers attacked entrenched Confederates. No man dare hereafter say anything in my presence against the bravery and soldierly qualities of the colored soldiers. In the 1864 presidential election, Democrats campaigned on ending the war. President Lincoln feared he would not win a second term. Crucial U.S. victories weeks before the election in Atlanta and the Shenandoah Valley ensured the president's re-election. Clouds of darkness are round about us. We're a desolate and smitten people. That winter, Lincoln pushed through a constitutional amendment aimed at abolishing slavery forever. In the spring of 1865, the United States armies roamed the Confederate heartland and punched through the crumbling defenses around Richmond. Fire set by fleeing Confederate troops engulfed the city. Shells in the burning arsenals began to explode and a smoke arose that shrouded the whole town. Three bridges spanning the James River were all on fire. Flakes of fire were falling on houses far and near. U.S. troops secured the city and extinguished the flames. Richmond has never before presented such a spectacle of jubilee. What a wonderful change has come over the spirit of Southern dreams. President Lincoln traveled to Richmond to tour the captured capital. When he reached the Confederate executive mansion, a weary Lincoln paused to rest. Thank God I have lived to see this. I have been dreaming a horrid dream for four years, and now a nightmare is gone. Within days of Richmond's capture, Confederate forces across the South surrendered, beginning with Lee's army at Appomattox. In Washington, at the moment of triumph, an assassin shot President Lincoln, sending the United States into mourning and confusion. I 
I cannot begin to realize the death of my beloved brother. I find myself continually thinking of him as alive. Orphans, widows, and bereaved parents mourned for generations. The victory of U.S. forces saved the nation and with it the world's hopes of an enduring democratic republic. The war ended slavery for almost four million people. The bravery of the United States colored troops strengthened black people's claims to citizenship. New amendments to the U.S. Constitution acknowledged the citizenship of freed people and voting rights to black men. Able to hold public office for the first time, black legislators helped write new constitutions for southern states. Black people made new lives for themselves, building churches, schools, and businesses. A new generation of black leaders came of age and fought to sustain ideals of equality and justice. I felt like anything rather than rejoicing at the downfall of a foe who fought so long and valiantly and had suffered so much for a cause, though that cause was, I believe, one of the worst for which a people ever fought. The white South thought their surrender meant that nothing more would be asked or demanded of them. They saw Appomattox as an ending, and many would resist the more profound revolution that was to come. The war did not decide Negro equality, Negro suffrage, or states' rights. These things the Southern people will still claim in their rights and views. Black people themselves worked to make sure that the war and the freedom it brought had not been in vain. The fight for justice continued in a nation transformed by the American Civil War. Liberty has been won. The battle for equality is still pending. The reconstruction of this union is broader, deeper work than the restoration of the rebel states. It is the lifting up of the entire nation into the practical realization of our Republican idea. This nation shall have a new birth of freedom and the government of the people, by the people, for the people, shall not perish from the earth.